Uh, it isn't often you get to meet people who are uh, important figures. But if you work in community-led libraries, John Pateman is an important figure. Uh, John was part of the working group which advised the UK government on the Libraries for All project in 1999, which in turn led to the Open to All, the Public Library and Social Exclusion Research project, which inspired the Working Together project in Canada, which in turn inspired us. As head of libraries in Merton, he won the Chartered Institute of Library and Information Professionals Library Change Libraries Change Lives Award for services to refugees and asylum seekers in 2001. John won a second Libraries Change Lives Award for his work with uh, migrant workers while he was working for the Lincolnshire Libraries. He's written numerous articles on social exclusion, including chapters on community-led work for the official history of British public libraries from 1995 to 2010. John is the co-author of two books, Public Libraries and Social Justice with John Vincent, and Developing Community-Led Libraries with previous EPL Leader-in-Residence, Ken Williman. John has spread the words about community-led libraries through presentations in the United Kingdom, Canada, Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, Denmark, and Sweden. Please join me in welcoming him to do the same here. Edmonton, say hello to John Pateman. I always start my presentations with a big drink of water. So. Anyway, good morning, Edmondson. Um, I come here this morning not as some kind of uh, guru, but as, as a friend of yourselves. Uh, and thanks very much for inviting me here to your wonderful city. I had a wonderful day yesterday visiting some of your libraries, including your latest branch library, very impressive. Uh, but more importantly, I got to actually talk to some of your staff uh, and kind of get underneath the skin of what this community-led library thing is. I knew before I, I came here uh, that you have probably got the reputation of being the leading public library organization in the world in terms of community-led work. But I kind of wanted to put that to a bit of a test um, by uh, chatting uh, and exploring some of those issues. And certainly the meeting I went to yesterday afternoon uh, was evidence to me that you're serious about this issue. It's also a challenge for me to do this presentation because normally when I, when I talk about community-led or as I prefer to term it, needs-based library work, I'm talking to people who either haven't got a clue what I'm talking about, so that's a great start for me, you know, I am the kind of expert there, um, or they don't know how to get going or they want some kind of advice and tips, but given that you're already well down this road, this is a kind of a, a challenge in terms of how I'm going to pitch the presentation. But I feel very much coming to Edmonton as if I've come home, because I started this journey in the UK in 1999 with, with a piece of research um, or with some work with the government which turned into some research. Um, those ideas came out. They weren't fully embraced, I might say, by the UK public library community. Uh, people were kind of scared of them, fearful of them, didn't like them for all kinds of reasons. But the country that did take them up, did take them to heart, was Canada through the Working Together project. And I've been tracking very carefully um, how that's panned out in Halifax, in Edmonton, uh, in other, other places across Canada. And so when I had the chance to come and work here in Canada, up at Thunder Bay, it felt like I was kind of completing that cycle that began way back in 1999-2000. Um, and would you believe the um, ideas we're using up at Thunder Bay to develop our own community-led model are your own Edmonton uh, toolkit? So it all seems very kind of right uh, that, I'm, that I'm here today. Um, we were talking yesterday about what kind of analogy we could use for the, 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 the thing you've got here around community-led, and it seems you're, you're, you've got this idea of a kind of a train, you know, the kind of train model. Um, and I would say that in terms of community-led work, you've actually built the train and it's left the station. Now, many other library services haven't even built the train yet. So I would translate that in terms of you've got a clear strategy about where you're going with community-led work, uh, and you've got a structure for delivering it, which is the community development staff, etc. Then there's the question, is everybody on board the train, and are there any gaps in the track which might derail the train? Well, I think maybe that's where there needs to be some more focus in terms of some of the systems you operate, which can create some barriers, perhaps, and also the whole organisational culture, which I'll go into uh, in my presentation. Um, and again, at the cluster meeting yesterday afternoon, you were asking all the right questions, 
Uh, and as I said then, it's okay if you don't know all the answers, because that's the nature of community-led work. It is the unknown, and it's the unknown that keeps you out of the comfort zone. And if you're back in the comfort zone, then you're not doing the community-led thing. So it is unsettling to be on a train if you don't know exactly where it's going. Um, but my advice is just to sit back and enjoy the ride. So those are just my kind of preliminary comments. I'm going to launch into the presentation now around relationships, the heart of the community-led library system. And uh, what I'm going to be doing over the next hour or so is exploring three hypotheses. One is that in order to develop needs-based and community-led libraries, we should take a holistic and systematic approach to organisational change, which encompasses strategy and structures, and by that I mean staffing and services, and also systems and culture. And I think it's the systems and culture where maybe Edmonton um, needs to develop. And by culture, I mean the way we do things around here. Secondly, second hypothesis, we need to create good internal relationships between staff before we can create meaningful and sustained relationships with the communities we serve. And this is a lesson I've learned, that often we're very keen to do community-led work. We want to kind of dash out into the community and, and do that great stuff. But often we have to um, mend or fix or develop internal relationships between different parts of the library service to make sure that we're a cohesive organisation uh, relating to, to that community. And the third hypothesis is that we need to move away from provider-led outreach models of engagement and towards community development approaches which actively involve local people in the planning, design, delivery and evaluation of library services. And to do all of that will require a number of fundamental shifts in our thinking and working practices, in our attitudes and behaviours and in our hearts and minds. So we, move, we need to move from outreach to community development. That shift is already clearly happening here. We need to move from customer service, transactional type relationships, to uh, community-led relationships. We need to move from traditional service planning to community-led service planning, and from outputs to outcomes. We also need to move from the known to the unknown, and from success to innovation. Further shifts are required from us being experts to being co-producers of services, from consultation to meaningful engagement, from wants, which is often demands from the community, to actually identifying and meeting needs. And just some, some definitions thrown in at the end here. So when I talk about success, I'm talking about the actual processes that we use as well as the relationships. And those relationships are sustained interactions with people over time rather than one-offs. And the engagement is the active involvement in the planning, design, delivery and evaluation of services. I'd like to root this kind of conversation in a very important piece of research called The Spirit Level, uh, Why Equality is Better for Everyone. Uh, and this was published in a book by Wilson and Pickett in 2010, which I would really recommend. And this, the, this book is based on massive research uh, looking at all kinds of indices across 23 countries. And what they found is that almost everything, including library use, is affected not by how wealthy a society is, but how equal a society is. And that societies with a bigger gap between rich and poor are bad for everyone in them, including the well-off. So there's a, there's a real role here for libraries to play in narrowing the inequality gap. If then we look at the income inequality data from that research, we find, for example, that um, there's, a, there's very low levels of inequality in Scandinavian countries, such as Finland, who were second on the list of 23 countries, Denmark, uh, and, and Sweden. And Canada was kind of mid-table. So Canada's not very, not completely equal, not completely unequal. It's kind of halfway there at number 12. The UK, where I come from, is at number 20. And we wouldn't be surprised to see maybe uh, the US down there at 22. So big differences in, in income inequality. When we then look at library use, we find that the library out of those 23, the, sorry, the country out of those 23 with the highest levels of library use in terms of visits is Finland, followed by Denmark, followed by Sweden, uh, and Canada's again kind of midway at number 14. So what we see if we put those two tables together, if we look at equality and library use, there's a very close correlation between 
levels of inequality and levels of library use. So I, I would argue it's in our interests to work to make society more equal, because the more equal we make society, the more people get to use us. There's a kind of a, a, a logic built into that. And I have a dream um, of, uh, and this dream is based on research and good practice in the UK and Canada and Scandinavia, based around these concepts. First of all, a needs-based library service, which is one which is able to identify, prioritise and meet community needs. Uh, that then leads into the whole community-led libraries in terms of service planning, design, delivery and evaluation. Uh, and to achieve that, we need to take this whole service approach around strategy, structures, systems and culture. I also tend to use this way of representing the challenge, the, the needs-based challenge. In any typical library community, and you'll have your own stats for, um, for Edmonton, we find this kind of pattern of library use. So in the centre of the diagram are our active users. Now there's different ways of defining active, but for these purposes, this, these are people who have a library, library card, they come into the library regularly and they use a wide range of services. And, and you all know who those are in your setting. But they only make up 13% uh, of the population. We then have another tier of what I call passive users. Now these are people who may or may not have a library ticket and they use the library on an as and when basis. When they need the library they come and use us but they're not here every day. And they make up a further 27%. But the biggest group by far are the non-users, which is 60%. And these are people who often have never, never used the library service in their lives. Their families have got no history of library use. Um, and they are clearly the largest segment. And what we tend to do in this kind of model is put a lot of our, a lot of our attention, a lot of our resources into our active users, because they're the easiest people to work with. They're, they actually come into the library, they look like us, they sound like us. They're the kind of dominant reader profile. If we have some additional resources, we may move out of that inner circle into the center circle and do some marketing, some promotion, and try to engage the passive users. But what we don't do enough of, we don't get out into that outer circle and engage with the non-users, finding out why they, don't, why they don't use us and what their needs are. So if we reverse this model, the, and in this model the, the figures are exactly the same, but you'll see that the order of priority has changed. The number one priority now are the, num the non-users. And with the needs-based approach, we start on the outside of the circle and work our way in, uh, which means turning a number of things in our organisation on their head, including uh, the whole allocation of resources. We then move in towards the centre, and if we've got enough funding, um, we, we end up in the, in the centre of the diagram. This doesn't mean that we abandon those active users in the middle there. Uh, it's my view that they know what the library service is, they know how to use it, they need less of our attention, less of our capacity, it doesn't, but it doesn't mean that we ignore them. It just means that we put more focus on the non-users. And the thing I like about this diagram is it, it suggests that the people with the greatest needs are on the outside of the circle, often on the outside of society, they're hanging on by their fingertips in all kinds of ways. And that's why it's important that we start there. Because if we build an inclusive model that can meet their needs, then the needs of the other two segments are kind of automatically accommodated and things get better for everyone. So it's not an us and them model, it's a win-win-win scenario. And the way that I present this model is that often the people who use us the most have the least needs, which is the people in the middle, and the people who need us the most but use us the least are the ones on the, in the outer circle. And that's what needs to change. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, tackling uh, those issues, um, we can do so through um, identifying community needs via community profiles and assessments and by partnership working and relationship building. But I would suggest that the community profiles we develop aren't just based on official statistics, which are often misleading and out of date and don't count the kind of people in the outer circle. We need to have more holistic uh, ways of profiling our communities. And it does mean prioritising those with the greatest needs. And then those needs can be met via universal services, the things that we provide to everybody, but also via targeted services. But it's when we get into the issue of redirected resources that we really start to 
challenge the system, we get challenges from our users, we get challenges from our politicians and our board members, and we get uh, challenges from our staff. And that's inevitable when you go down this route. You just need to think that through in advance and be ready, be ready and able to explain why we're making these changes from outreach to community development. And of course, this is one of the fundamental shifts from outreach to community development, whereby we move away from uh, pre-packaging services that we designed ourselves, taking them out to communities on a kind of take it or leave it basis, and then evaluating the success using statistical uh, measures uh, to a situation with a community development model where we're doing all of, that, all of those operations, the planning, the design, the delivery, and the evaluation with the active involvement of community members. And I heard some great examples of that happening yesterday, and I heard some uh, wonderful stories this morning about some of the community work happening at this branch. So what I'd like to do now is just run you through very quickly what I think a community-led library service looks like, and then we can home in on those elements where Edmonton is particularly strong and maybe the areas for, for further development. And this is, this is kind of a summary of the book that I wrote with Ken Williment. So it's a bit of a plug for the book. Um, I think you need to read it to get, to get the full kind of context. Um, but it does give this impression that developing community-led public libraries requires a systematic and holistic approach to transforming all aspects of service delivery from consultation and needs assessment to standards and monitoring of services. At the core of community-led libraries is relationship building, both internally within the organisation and externally with local communities. Libraries must have the strategies, structures, systems and organisational cultures which enable them to identify, prioritise and meet community needs. Local people must be involved in every stage of the library planning process, from design and planning through to service delivery and evaluation. Consultation can take many forms, but is often limited to the passive giving of information or the reactions of local communities to proposals which have already been developed by library experts. The community-led approach enables local residents and organisations to work in shared planning and action with the library. The highest level of engagement is, lead is a leadership model in which the community initiates and leads on issues with support from library services. Consultation and engagement are the building blocks of relationship building, needs assessment and research. Community profiles and community asset mapping can establish baselines of what resources are currently available and what is required to meet community needs. These needs may range from very basic physiological requirements, food, clothing, shelter, to self-actualization, which is realizing a person's full potential. So this model is very much based on the Maslow hierarchy or pyramid of needs. The community is an expert in its own needs and a library should prioritise with the, those with the greatest needs. Library needs assessment can be co-produced by the library and community working together in partnership. Library image and identity are significant factors in library use and non-use. And I would certainly say the EPL has got a very strong identity and it's very present. It was very present to me when I first arrived in the city on Monday night and was walking around. I could kind of find evidence of, of, of the library everywhere. There are a number of barriers, however, to be overcome, including those which are institutional, just opening hours. I think, again, EPL's got very good opening hours, but also the whole area of rules and regulations. There are personal and social barriers, lack of basic skills, low income and poverty, environmental barriers, access, isolation, poor transport links, and perceptional barriers, which are perhaps the strongest of all, and lack of awareness. People who think that libraries are not for them, that they're not relevant to their lives. Attempts have been made to change the image of libraries through rebranding exercises, such as idea stores, you may have heard of those in the UK, and discovery centers. And also libraries have also been co-located with a range of other services to break down media-driven stereotypes and myths. The word library is often synonymous with a building full of books, but community-led libraries are focused more on people and relationships. Outreach is predicated on assumed needs, with programs and services designed, planned, delivered and evaluated by library experts. Community development is premised on shared resources, values and outcomes. Libraries must be transformed into living rooms of the community and democratic public spaces which are owned by communities. 
Information and communications technology is a means to an end, to meet community needs, and not an end in itself, or, or a magic bullet which can make libraries socially inclusive. ICT has an important role to play as a tool which can be targeted at socially excluded communities to provide access to digital skills and services, including e-governments. Material selection has always been a political decision, small p, and has often been used as an agent of social control rather than social change. Reads versus needs is an ongoing debate between those who see libraries as gatekeepers of knowledge and worthy literature and others who view them as gateways to popular culture. Community-led libraries place more emphasis on equity than excellence and recognise that libraries exist to meet community needs rather than uphold professional standards. Community-led libraries put people first, which means that great care must be taken in selecting the right man, I use that in quotation marks, I mean man and woman here. Empathy and social skills are more important than technical library qualifications. Staff training and development should focus on developing a portfolio of community development skills which would cover communication, listening skills, influencing relationships, reflective practice, improved confidence and assertiveness, negotiation skills and dealing with conflicts. The community-led library worker skill set should include a blend of personal attributes and behaviours, including values and ethics, generic skills, community engagement for example, core library and information skills, reading, learning, and information literacy, and specific leadership and management skills finance, HR, and performance management. So a real a wide bundle of skills is required. Social exclusion must be mainstreamed so that it drives all aspects of library service. Strategic objectives should be informed by community needs and reflected in service and staffing structures. This will determine what, when, where, and how library services will be provided and the experience, knowledge, and competences required to deliver those services. The strategic objectives will also be used to determine if library systems are fit for purpose and able to meet community needs. Some policies, practices and procedures are barriers to access and should be removed, while others just require fine-tuning. New systems also may also be needed. Most importantly, the organisational culture, the way we do things around here, must be aligned with the social inclusion strategy. Cultural change is deeply embedded and can take time to, sorry, culture is deeply embedded and can take time to change, but this process can be accelerated via service planning, performance measures and workforce development. Community-led libraries must be clear about what impacts and outcomes they are aiming to achieve and what criteria they will use to determine success. Crude quantitative measures such as visit and circulation counts are of very limited value in evaluating community outcomes. Qualitative measures are needed which focus on satisfaction, personal narratives and life-changing impacts. An impact model can assess how library activities and resources produce immediate personal benefits such as feeling empowered, informed and enriched, intermediate outcomes such as social capital, well-being and health, and long-term outcomes including stronger communities and better quality of life. In conclusion, the community-led library provides a blueprint for change and a roadmap for developing needs-based and socially inclusive services. The key to success is relationship building to enable meaningful consultation, needs assessment and research. Once community needs have been identified and prioritised, all aspects of service delivery must be reviewed and transformed, including library image and identity, and a shift from outreach and partnership working to community development and co-production. ICT must be used as an enabler rather than a panacea, and materials provision and staff recruitment, training and education can all be informed by community needs. Social exclusion is mainstreamed as a strategic priority, and library standards and monitoring of services move beyond statistics to qualitative measurement and community narratives. If libraries go down this route, they will improve services to existing users, attract back lapsed users, and appeal to a wide range of new users who previously thought that the library is not for me. By working together with communities, libraries can truly be open to all. And when we did the Open to All project, we deliberately put a question mark after that statement, open to all, because I think the assumption up until that point was, by definition, libraries are open to all. We open our doors in the morning, people can come in, if they don't come in, it's kind of their problem. And clearly the community-led model uh, is, a, is a response and a challenge to that question mark. 
Now, in the in the UK, we had a we had a long running uh, a children's program called Blue Peter. I don't know if you've heard of that, um, but there was always a point in the show where they 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 get the kids to make something, and they always the kids kind of start making it, and then under the counter they get one out and they say, "Well, here's one we made earlier." Yeah, it's kind of a fully made model constructed out of squeezy bottles and toilet rolls and goodness knows what. So I thought I would just. Um, now produce the process that we're going through up at Thunder Bay, um, based on all of the work that's happened here and elsewhere, in terms of a fundamental library review, which is what we're calling it, and how we're seeking to transform Thunder Bay public libraries. And the overall objective of this program is to change the organisational culture, that's where we're starting first, the way we do things around here, the hearts and minds, the behaviours and attitudes of Thunder Bay Public Library through a systematic and holistic change program which has three key elements. So in my view to really make community led, um, uh, to make the community led approach work we need to make sure we're dealing with strategy, structure and systems at the same time they all overlap, they all affect each other and collectively this is what changes the organisational culture. So the aim is to develop a new strategic plan, why we are here, where we are going, through an inclusive process which engages all key stakeholders, board management staff, partners, active users, passive users, and non-users. And the strat plan we were just about to launch in Thunder Bay was constructed with all of those people around the table. And it was very interesting to hear, for example, the perspective of a non-user at that table as against a staff member who maybe had some of those uh, assumed needs. And from that strategic plan, we're now going to develop a service plan, how we're we going to deliver the strategic plan objectives, which is realistic, flexible, and sustainable. We're then going to go on to develop a service structure in terms of buildings, services, collections, and programs, which is able to deliver the strategic plan objectives. So everything is driven by the strategic plan. And also to develop a staffing structure in terms of job titles, job descriptions and competencies, which is able to, again able to deliver the strategic plan objectives. And what the strat plan does, it just kind of keeps us on course. It makes sure that everything we do is being done to support the delivery of the plan. And then we come on to systems, to review all systems. And my, my definition of a system is any kind of policy, any kind of process or procedure to ensure that they are, again, able to deliver the strategic plan objectives. And it's often in this area of systems where we find barriers to uh, the full community-led approach. That could be around fees and charges. It could be around uh, just the way we organize our services. And we need to fine tune those systems, maybe develop new ones, and certainly get rid of those that don't help. And we're kind of working our way through a whole pile of, of written policies, many of which will become completely redundant uh, in terms of our new way of working. So culture change will take time. It doesn't happen overnight, but it can be accelerated via service planning, which is the whole strategy piece, through workforce development, staff training, and, and new structures and also through performance management and systems. And the aim is that by 2016, the way that we do things at Thunder Bay Library will have changed to the development of new attitudes and behaviours, and a new set of shared values in terms of hearts, minds and actions. And this new culture will then inform the development of the next strategic plan, which will take us into the future. The Fundamental Library Review is broken down into stages, years and quarters within each year, with parallel activities regarding strategy, structures and systems. So in year one of the process, which is where we are at the moment, we're doing the big engagement and involvement piece with the staff, with the board, with the community. Next year we're going to move on to implementation of some of those ideas, and that's where the step change will start to occur. And in the third year, we'll be doing some evaluation and consolidation. In putting the strap plan together, uh, which actually launched the whole process, uh, we did this across a number of phases. Um, we did a review of the existing strap plan, we did a stakeholder analysis, uh, then we moved on and did some community engagement, and we did a SWOT analysis. These are all kind of standard strap plan tools, SWOT being strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. 
Uh, we then did a pest pestle analysis, looking at the political, see if I can remember these, political, economic, um, help me, technological, legal, and environmental um, context that we're working in. And we put together a community review panel uh, of community members who are going to stay with us on this journey. So they're here working with us at the beginning on developing the strap plan, but the same people, the, there may be some turnover inevitably, uh, will stay with us as we then roll that plan out in terms of delivery, and they'll work with us on the evaluation as well. Phase four was in terms of prioritising the issues, because a big part of this process is that we can't possibly be everything to everybody. We haven't got, we've got limit, you know, we haven't got limitless resources. We have to learn to say no. We have to learn to switch things off. And that all went into an action plan. And we're at the stage now of having the, the, the draft plan and we're reviewing it and finalising it. And when I get back to Thunder Bay next week, uh, we'll, we'll actually finish that process off. What that will then give us is a very important tool, which I call the strategic sieve, which again is a very, very simple concept. So once we've determined what our strategic objectives are via the strap plan process, we'll be able to de develop this, this uh, sieve. So imagine that these circles are three overlapping sieves or sorters, and each sieve represents a strategic objective. SO1, for example, could be around diversity and inclusion. SO2 could be around nurturing the local, local economy. SO3 could be around uh, another key indicator. Where CIV2 overlaps um, with CIV1, for example, this creates a, um, a, a double filter. So wherever there's an over, a single overlap, there's a double filter. It's harder for stuff to get through at that point. And where all three CIVs overlap right in the middle of the diagram, that creates a triple filter which is more, even more difficult for stuff to, to get through. So whenever a project, an idea, a partnership proposal, a funding opportunity, anything comes into the organisation or, or emerges from the organisation, we're going to put it through this sieve. And if it gets through one of the filters, it's got a chance of becoming maybe a, a level one, a kind of lower level priority. If it passes through two of the filters, if it's hitting two of our key objectives, then it will become maybe a level two or a medium level priority. If it passes through them all three, then it will become a level three and a high level priority. And if it doesn't pass through any of the sieves, it won't be a priority for us at all. And this will help us to say yes, maybe, or no, but with a strategic rationale to any new projects. And this should enable us to develop a realistic and achievable service plan. Because my staff are always saying to me, John, we haven't got enough time, we haven't got enough resources to, to do all the work we need to do. And I say, well, who developed the plan that you're working to? And they say, well, I did. I say, well, then you're in some control here, yeah? But you need a mechanism for filtering that down to a realistic level. In terms of the staffing structure, this is very much about getting the right people in the right jobs with the right skills. And I think the skill set is around communication, listening and negotiation, that whole arena of influencing relationships, reflective practice, which we don't do enough, enough of because we haven't got enough time, so we need to create that time, improved confidence and assertiveness, and that whole, no whole notion of dealing with conflict. And I think in terms of staffing structures, we can take a very kind of specialist approach. We can set up a special team or designate um, certain members of our staff to do the work. And, and there's some big advantages in that approach. I think it creates a kind of a vanguard service. It enables us to take a big leap forward. Uh, it, it enables those people to, to play around, to experiment. So there's innovation and change. It enables us to develop new collections and services. Those people can also um, get their own uh, in-depth knowledge of local communities, and they can raise awareness among library staff and provide, provide training and guidance. So taking a specialist staffing approach has got some advantages, but it's also got some downsides. There's a danger that the work can become isolated and not mainstreamed. It can create effectively a two-tier service, a kind of community-led and a not-so-community-led. Um, there may not be any right redirection of resources to support the work. The whole library staff may not be engaged in the process. There may be limited access to resources. It becomes more of a peripheral activity. There may be a lack of performance measures. And that work may not be valued and may be vulnerable to, um, to budget cuts or future changes. 
So I would always advocate a whole service approach rather than a special uh, staff approach. And within this model of the whole service, then the structures, the staffing structures, are completely aligned with the service strategy. Everyone's job is community-led. Staff are clear about what is expected of them. Everyone is pulling in the same direction. Um, impact and outcome indicators are clear to all. There's a positive effect on organisational culture. And the community-led approach becomes embedded and not vulnerable to changes of policy or budget reductions. And I'd like to kind of veer off here at a, at a, a bit, slight, slight tangent, but to explore some, some stuff around motivation, of how we can kind of motivate staff to be engaged in this area of work. Uh, and I like this whole notion of motivation 3.0. You can tell by my slides that I'm not a very kind of techie guy, you know. This is, this is a triumph of content over format. This is, this is as good as it gets. Um, but there is this notion that societies like computers uh, have operating systems, a set of mostly invisible instructions and protocols on which everything runs. And the first operating system, Motivation 1.0, was all about survival. Its successor, Motivation 2.0, was built around external rewards and punishments, extrinsic motivation. And, and that, I think, is still the culture in many library services. And it works very fine uh, for routine 20th century type tasks. But in the 21st century where we are now, motivation 2.0, extrinsic motivation, is proven incompatible with how we organize what we do, how we think about what we do, and how we do what we do. And I think we need an upgrade to motivation 3.3, which is all about intrinsic motivation. So traditional if-then, if you do this, then you will get that type rewards, can give us less of what we want. They can extinguish intrinsic motivation, they can diminish performance, cross creativity, and crowd out good behavior. They can also give us more of what we don't want. They can encourage cheating, shortcuts, unethical behavior, create addictions, and foster short-term thinking. They are the bugs in our current operating system. So this is the whole notion of carrots and sticks, rewards and punishment, which aren't all bad. They can be effective for rule-based routine tasks because there's little intrinsic motivation to undermine and not much creativity to crush. That's when it's just routine. And they can be more effective still if those giving such rewards offer a rationale for why the task is necessary. Acknowledge that it's boring and allow people autonomy over how they complete it. But for non-routine conceptual tasks, which is where I think community-led work is, rewards and punishments are more perilous, particularly those of the if-then variety. But now that, now that you have achieved this, you will get that rewards, which are non-contingent rewards given after a task is complete, can sometimes be okay for those more creative, that more creative work, especially if they provide useful information about performance. Non-tangible rewards, praise and positive feedback, are much less corrosive than cash and trophies. I think we kind of already know that. So motivation 2.0, that kind of reward and punishment model, depended on and fostered what's known as type X behavior which is fueled more by extrinsic desires than intrinsic ones and concerned less with the in inherent satisfaction of an activity and more with the external rewards to which an activity leads. Motivation 3.0, on the other hand, depends on and fosters type I behavior, which concerns itself less with the external rewards an activity brings and more with the inherent satisfaction of the activity itself. We need to move ourselves from type X to type I, now the good news is that type I's are made, not born. And type I behavior leads to stronger performance, greater health, and high overall, higher overall well-being. Our default setting, I would say, is to be autonomous and self-directed. And we had a, I had a conversation yesterday at one of your branch libraries around the whole notion of autonomy versus kind of centralized control and, and the uh, tension between those. But I think our, our, our automatic place is to be autonomous and self-directed. But unfortunately, circumstances, including outdated notions of management, often conspire to change that default setting and turn us from type I, 
There are managers or staff who think that staff want to do a good job and will accept and even seek responsibility to type X. Managers who think that staff must be coerced, controlled, directed and threatened with punishment to get them to work. To encourage type I behaviour, people need autonomy, that key word, over task, so what they do, over time, when they do it, over team, who they do it with, and over technique, how they do it. While Motivation 2.0 required compliance, Motivation 3.0 demands engagement. Only engagement can produce mastery, becoming better at something that matters. Mastery begins with flow, optimal experiences when the challenges we face are matched to our abilities. Now, smart workplaces supplement day-to-day -day activities with what are known as Goldilocks tasks, not too hard and not too easy. A mastery is a mindset. It requires the capacity to see your abilities not as finite, but as infinitely improvable. Mastery is a pain. It demands effort, grit, and deliberate practice. But mastery is also, and I struggle with this word, an asymptote. asymptote. It's impossible to fully realize, which makes it simultaneously frustrating and alluring. So it's something that we're always striving to achieve, which I think is very much the community-led notion. Humans by their nature seek purpose, a cause greater and more enduring than themselves. In Motivation 3.3, purpose maximization is taking its place alongside profit maximization as an aspiration and a guiding principle. Within organizations, this purpose motive is expressing itself in three ways. In goals that use profit to reach purpose, in words that emphasize more than self-interest, so it's the we rather than they, than they, and in policies that allow people to pursue purpose on their own terms. I now want to kind of ground all of that theory around autonomy, mastery, and purpose in the whole community-led model. How does it kind of fit in? And I want to do that by just telling a very quick story. And I think it says something about the systems that we operate and particularly defines. So in 2000, a group of childcare facilities in Haifa, Israel, was studied for 20 weeks. The centres opened at 7.30 a.m. and closed at 4 p.m. Parents had to collect their children by the closing time or a teacher would have to stay late. During the first four weeks of the experiment, the researchers recorded how many parents arrived late each week. Then before the fifth week, they announced that parents who collected their children late would be fined the equivalent of three U.S. dollars. So the system was working fine, people were bringing, collecting their kids on time, then someone had the bright idea of incentivizing this by saying, if you don't bring your kids, if you don't collect your kids on time, we're going to charge you three dollars. The aim was to reduce the number of times that children were collected late by imposing a fine on the offending parents. But that's not what happened. After the introduction of the fine, there was a steady increase in the number of parents coming late. The rate finally settled at a level that was higher and almost twice as large as the initial one. So one reason most people showed up on time is that they had a relationship with the teachers and wanted to treat them fairly. Parents had an intrinsic desire to be scrupulous about punctuality. But the threat of a fine edged aside that third drive. The fine shifted the parents' decision from a partly moral obligation to be fair to my kids' carers to a pure transaction I can buy extra time. There wasn't room for both. The punishment didn't promote good behavior. It crowded it out. It's been my lifelong ambition to eliminate fines from a library service that I manage. And I'm determined to achieve it at Thunder Bay. Because what I know is that imposing fines does not necessarily encourage people to bring books back on time. But it is for sure the number one barrier to access. And it does effectively crowd out good behavior. So here are some games we can play in terms of engendering motivation three type behavior. We can play the whose purpose is it anyway game by gathering your team, your department, or even your whole staff together, hand everyone a blank card, ask each person to write down his or her one sentence answer to the following question. What is the purpose of Edmonton Public Library? Collect the cards and read them aloud. What do they tell you? Are the answers similar? Is everyone aligned along a common purpose? Or are they all over the place? 
If people don't know why they're doing what they're doing, how can you expect them to be motivated to do it? So that common sense of purpose is very important. And you can also conduct an autonomy audit. How much autonomy do you have over your, over your tasks at work? What you do in a given day? How much autonomy do you have over your time? How you allocate your hours each day? Over your team, are you able to choose who you work with? And over your technique, how you actually do your job? How much autonomy exists in EPL? Another interesting idea is this notion of 20% time, where you encourage staff to spend 20% of their hours working on any project they want. Now, you might want to start with 10%, it's a bit risky, uh, and just try it for six months. But by creating this island of autonomy, it will help staff act on their great ideas and convert their downtime into more productive time. And where this has been used in private industry, often some of the most innovative projects have come out of the 20% time rather than the, the, uh, the, the regular working hours. And finally on this session, you can give yourself um, a flow test. What moments in your, in your work really produce these feelings of flow? Where were you? What were you working on? Who were you with? Are certain times of the day more flow friendly than others? How could you restructure your day based on your findings? How might you increase the number of optimal experiences and reduce the, the moments when you feel disengaged or distracted? If you're having doubts about your job or career, what does this exercise tell you about your true source of intrinsic motivation? So I think this whole notion of shifting from extrinsic punishment and reward to intrinsic doing jobs that give you autonomy, mastery and control on purpose uh, is a critical shift in terms of community-led working. Moving on now to service structure, um, which is about having the right services in the right places at the right times. Um, clearly, the more opening hours we provide, we have more visitors, we get more visits from target groups, the number of books loan goes up, the use of IT goes up, those are all kind of taken as read and the opening hours at EPL are very generous I think. Uh, we need to consider uh, image and identity, so the whole design, the layout, the marketing and the branding. Uh, and also in terms of books and other stock, we need to look at the whole range, format, uh, are we involved in community and selection and e-books? So we have to do the whole review of the service structure um, next. And we can construct here a, a, a service sieve in the same way we had a strategic sieve earlier. And here the three big questions are, um, are the services that we provide useful? Are they usable? Uh, and are they desirable? And you can do a very simple test of this on your own. What services do you enjoy using? A restaurant, for example, that only has delicious food, but also a friendly staff, I'm sure, would be top of your list. Use your personal experience as a guide and adapt the elements that distinguish the services you enjoy. Increasing desirability might be a tough sell, since it is in part subjective. Can a library position itself as the cool place in town? Probably, though it might take a major brand restructuring. Think idea stores, which brought together libraries and adult learning, and discovery centres, which combine libraries, art galleries and museums. And think of ways to get people excited about using the library. All of our services need to meet these criteria. They all need to be useful, usable and desirable. By reviewing all services in this way, you'll start to get an idea where your library's overall strengths and weaknesses lay. You can then concentrate on making the most relevant and effective improvements. All, this, all the decisions made in your library every day contribute to or diminish its usefulness, usability and desirability. Keeping this in mind will help everyone make the right choices. Moving on to systems, and I think this is maybe an area where EPL might want to give some more attention, so I'll just take a quick sip of water. Systems, in my view, are often a, a huge barrier to, to moving forward. This could be inappropriate rules and regulations, charging policies which disadvantage those on low incomes, because we think maybe a 25 cent fine isn't a lot, but to some people it is. Bookstop policies which do not reflect the needs of the community could be another barrier. Lack of signage in buildings, and I know you've got a big signage project on the go, and a lack of a sense of ownership uh, and involvement by the community. 
Even simple library tasks can require library members to use multiple aspects of the library. For instance, take discovering an item, reserving it, and picking it up at the library. Here's a typical customer journey to accomplish this task. See the book recommendation in the library newsletter, place a hold on a book through the library website, receive the notification email, travel to the library, park in the lot, enter the building, take the child to the youth services department, locate the reserve shelf, locate the item on the shelf, reclaim child from children's room, walk to self-checkout machine, interact with library worker, exit building. So you can break down every um, process every service into those kind of stages and identify where the potential um, blocks and, and, and challenges might be. Designing the right systems takes a lot of effort and a lot, a lot of cross-departmental collaboration. Again, think of all the departments that are involved in just that simple task. Readers advisory librarians, selecting items to recommend, writing reviews, marketing, designing the newsletter, IT, sending the email notifications. It's a whole service kind of process. And again, we need to find how can we simplify that and how can we remove any barriers in that process. These processes may be very familiar to us. They may be very familiar to our active users in the, in the center of the diagram earlier. They could be complete mysteries to people who aren't so used to using us. In doing a systems review, I think it's useful to begin with a diverse team. This enables us to cross-fertilize ideas. Um, and make that group a kind of no competition zone, so we're into the whole collaboration way of working and, and co cooperation. And try a little task shifting, ask staff to train others in what they do, so that the staff can understand not only the processes that they design, but those that are designed by others. And animate with purpose, don't motivate with rewards, because nothing bonds a team together like a shared mission. Now the big one which I'll save to last, organizational culture, the way we do things around here, the attitudes, behaviors, and values, the hearts, minds, and actions, which distinguish Edmonton Public Library from all other organizations. Whereas strategy, structures, and systems are tangible, culture lies below the waterline and makes up the bulk of the hidden iceberg. So there's all kinds of analogies you can use for organizational culture. And I quite like this notion of the iceberg because we can see elements of it above the water, but most of it sits there kind of lurking beneath the service, surface. Strategy, structure, and systems, they can come and go, but nothing really changes unless the culture is changed. Culture, another analogy, culture is like wallpaper. It's hard to imagine how things could look differently since the way that, since the way that it looks is normal. It's, it's all around us. We can paint over it or we can peel it back and see what else can be there. There are two aspects to culture in Thunder Bay Public Library, and the same here. The way we work with each other, which is the internal relationships, and the way we work with local communities, the external relationships. Both are equally important, but we are going to focus initially on internal culture change. And I, and I was saying yesterday um, over dinner that I, the analogy I use here is the kind of uh, European uh, way of, uh, or or the uh, Western way of developing cars and the Japanese method. What we tend to do in the West uh, is to uh, produce a vehicle as quickly as we can and get it on the market. And if there's problems with it, then we recall it and we fix it and, and, we, and we kind of sort it out afterwards. Whereas the Japanese tend to spend a lot of time on the research and development so that when they launch a product, they know it's gonna, gonna, kind of going to work. Uh, and one of the lessons I've learned with community-led work is if we rush it and do it too quickly, if we don't use the kind of slow, fixed, reflective uh, approach, then we, we, we do rush out, we do wonderful things in the community, but then if the whole service isn't behind that focus, um, we, we, it, it, it doesn't kind of follow through. So we need to model ourselves more on the Japanese model, where we put a lot of effort into winning over hearts and minds, selling the benefits, selling the ideas, explaining the why, the why, and the why yet again before we actually launch. And that's what we're going to be doing certainly up at Thunder Bay, uh, focusing on the internal culture change. We need to change the way that we work with each other before we can change the way that we work with local communities. And there is also this notion, which, is, which I found is very 
strongly embedded in public libraries uh, of subcultures, of, of silo services, of people working for the adult lending service or the youth service or the reference service or the bibliographical service, which can create a kind of an us versus them mentality. So the question is, who do you work for? The answer, of course, is you work for Edmonton Public Library. Silo services aren't helpful. They don't achieve collaborative working. There can also be um, subcultures within branches. And this is where we have this gritty problem of wanting the local autonomy, wanting the local library to meet the needs of the local community and to reflect those needs and to have its own identity, but also be part of a one system. So we want to avoid the branch subculture and of course, it can also lead to cliques and people feeling included uh, and excluded. So we really must move from the us and them scenario to the I we. So there's a very simple pronoun test here. Do staff at EPL, um, re well, do they refer to EPL as they, which suggests disengagement and alienation, or as we, where staff feel part of something significant and meaningful? So ask staff who do they work for? Some may say adult services, or they may say a particular branch library. The right answer, of course, is Edmonton Public Library. And I'll leave you with this final thought, um, which is an, an, a nice quote. Uh, what the hell is water? Um, wa the water is habits, the unthinking choices, the invisible decisions that surround us every day, and which, just by looking at them, become visible again. Water is the most apt analogy for how a habit works. Water hollows out for itself a channel which grows broader and deeper. And after having ceased to flow, it resumes when it flows again the path traced by itself before. So the way we habitually think of our surroundings and ourselves create the worlds that each of us inhabit. There are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, Morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks at the other and goes, what the hell is water? And that is the big culture shift that we need to make. People don't see it because it's around them all the time. And we need to create an alternative to that, an alternative that's able to deliver the, the uh, community-led library. In terms of putting ideas into action, there are some useful resources. Um, and I've got a list here. So there was the Open Tool Research, question mark, the Public Library and Social Exclusion, which kind of started the whole thing off. I developed that into um, a guide around developing a needs-based library service. There was another publication with John Vincent on public libraries and social justice, which I think is at the heart of community-led work. And then my latest book with Ken Williman came out uh, end of last year, Community-Led Libraries. And it does reference much of the work that EPL is doing in there. So I've, I've finished uh, the presentation, not on a not on a crescendo, on a bit of a bit of a whimper. Um, I'm running out of energy, clearly, and I am one minute off my allocated finishing time, which was 11 o'clock. So I will finish now for thunderous applause and questions. Thank you very much. So please, shoot, shoot me down. Yes? I'm going to suggest that sometimes the community itself doesn't always know what comes from the library. You don't know if you have answers to that. Thoughts on that? I think the, um, the, the way I would rephrase the question, if you don't mind, is what the community needs from the library. So I think uh, I'm very much still focused on this whole notion of a needs-based library service. I think for a long time we've been based on people's wants and demands, and where we need to reposition ourselves is actually meeting needs. But of course, identifying needs is, is notoriously difficult, which is why we have to have the whole relationship building and, and community-led approach. And then once we've identified those needs, we need to be able to prioritise them and actually meet them through through our services. And that's where the whole thing becomes interesting but also challenging because uh, we're basically saying that some people's needs are more important than others and that's, that's kind of quite a quite a bold statement to make and quite a, a, a tough call to put out there because I, I think our business really is in helping those with the greatest needs to, to resolve those, those issues so the, the first test is 
is it a, is it a need or a want? And if it's a, if it's a want, then we need to either turn it into a need or frankly move on. That's, that's one way of looking at it. And it's this whole notion of being able to say yes, no, and maybe, and running things through sieves, etc. But there's no doubt that the experts of the needs are the community themselves. And we must never second guess or assume or um, stereotype in, in, in kind of guessing what those, those needs are, which is why the conversation's got to be with the, with the community member. They really are the experts in this scenario. Does that answer your question? Uh, not really. Okay, <laughs> then ask it again. <laughs> I think I think the purpose of the relationship is to identify the need, yeah. But it might not be the initial conversation, as we were saying this morning. You might have to have a lot of conversations before you actually get to that point where the needs start to emerge. I don't think you can force the process. I think it's a kind of natural, organic process that comes out of that. And I think also. Uh, where possible, it's best to have the individual conversation because agencies are wonderful people to work with and we need them as partners and they've got skills and information that we haven't got. But sometimes they can, they can get into this thing about having assumptions and, and, and being second guessers as well. So you can't beat the, the, the direct conversation. And you can't assume that um, because one person lives in a com particular community that their needs are the same as everybody else's in that, in that community. And we made a huge mistake in the UK when we first went into the whole equality agenda uh, of assuming that uh, what one black person needs, all black people need, what one woman needs, all women needs, and that kind of very simple way of thinking. The, the, that's where the, the shift from equality to, to diversity comes in, where we're focused on individual needs. Everyone who comes into our library has got individual needs, and we've got to be able to identify and meet those. And, and the mantra that I always use is, from each according to their ability, so in terms of our staff, that's where the, the ability comes, and to each according to their needs. It's a very individually kind of focused program. It's very resource intensive. Uh, but it kind of builds up over time. I've got more nods then, so I'll take that as a positive performance indicator. I got to an outcome there rather than an output. Okay, cool. First of all, uh, don't beat yourselves up. You know, you're doing. You're the most advanced library service I've ever come across in terms of community-led work. So, so hang on to that. You know, you're you're more than halfway there. And the thing is, we don't know how far there is to go. It's an infinite thing. It's an unknown thing. It's difficult to measure. But you're further down down the track, whatever the analogy we want to use. So that that's a great strength that should give you great confidence in kind of in, in moving forward and I've only been in town for 36 hours so what do I know but there was again another I talked about Blue Peter earlier there was another wonderful show on British TV with this guy called John Harvey Jones who was a big industrialist type guy he was president of the Confederation of British Industry he'd walk into an organization and spend a day there just by looking around and talking to people and by the end of it he'd pretty much got a hang of kind of what was working and what needed to be fixed and I think it's possible to do that to a degree and I had the privilege of spending the whole day yesterday looking at your libraries and talking to your staff so yes I will give you some some advice some some guidance but take it with a pinch of salt you know in terms of the time scale I think you've nailed the strategy nailed it you've you've embedded community led work in, in your documentation and your policies and all, and all the rest of it. And that's no small achievement. And, and kudos to Linda and, and the leadership of the organization and the staff for, for doing that. That's a real, real huge step. That'll keep you on track. That'll make sure you continue this, this journey. I also think you've made great strides in terms of the, the structure piece, the, 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 particularly the, star, the staffing structure. You, you've carved out staffing resources that are focused on this work. 
Where there might be a bit of a glitch there is there's some, some of you, some staff who clearly get the whole community-led thing, you're committed to it, you're dedicated to it. Is everybody at the same pitch within the organisation? Probably not. And that would be an unreal, at this stage in the process, that would be an unrealistic expectation. And how many years it would have taken you to get there before you launched the project is an unknown quantity. One of the reasons why I'm at Thunder Bay, it's got four libraries and like 70 staff. So I can, I can accelerate that process just through sheer visibility. I can go around my four libraries in a day. I can talk to people on a daily basis. It's much harder to do here with a bigger system with more staff, more, more dispersed services. Yeah? So working on that, I think, is, is a challenge in terms of the, of the staffing structure. I think you've got a way to go in terms of your systems. Yeah, and that came up yesterday when we were looking at the five barriers to access. Some of those were, at least two of those, were to do with the systems that you currently operate. I've alluded to fines and charges. I think they create a, a huge perceptional and real financial barrier. And, and maybe you need to work towards that. Again, at Thunder Bay, we've only got a fines income of $90,000. Now, I think it's not a, a, incrementally we can, we can take that down to zero. It's not a big step. For some library services, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's a big part of the budget. You can't just do away with it overnight. It, you know, it, it takes time. But I think it's something you should work towards. And maybe also reviewing some of your other systems, some of your other written policies and practices, and really shining the community-led light on those to see, are they getting in the way of, of what you want to do? Mi simplifying them, minimizing them. And as part of that, giving staff more autonomy to opening up that whole debate between one, one library service and that kind of local control issue. And that, of course, that all feeds into the, the, the really big one, which is, which is the organizational culture. Because what I've seen happen a lot is people adopt the language of community-led, that they learn it and they repeat it, and they, they genuinely think that they're doing it, but they haven't actually they haven't actually started to think and act in different ways. And that's, that's the real test when people have actually shifted their thinking. And sometimes I think it was yourself who who liked the quote about uh, creating like an alternative. If you want to sell change, you've got to create an alternative to the current reality. And, and, and demonstrate the benefits to it and move people across from one to the other. So it's coming up with concrete examples of, of what we mean by community-led work. And the stories that I heard this morning in the office here made the hair on, on, on the neck stand up because they were just so powerful about how the staff, or how some of the staff here, are really impacting and changing people's lives. And I think on a very kind of human level, that's, that's a very powerful way of selling the difference between what we do now custodians of books, transactional type relationships to that whole new uh, way of working. So, so some ways to go, but you're a long way down the road. Did that answer your question? Well, I wanted, you know, something really specific, but that's Yes. And we should, we should stop seeking absolute answers to questions, and we should stop looking for the concrete, yeah? With community-led work, uh, being unknown, the unknowns are good. If you know all the answers, you're not doing it. You're, you're really not doing it, yeah? And, and the unknown keeps us out of that comfort zone. We're never quite sure, we're a bit on edge. We don't know what's gonna happen next. We're not in control. That is great. That's where you wanna be, yeah. Yeah? I'm having trouble in my head working between the idea that um, we're needing Mm -hmm. Can you can you try and turn it into a question? How <laughs> 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 I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I think I'm, I'm kind of um, getting, getting towards what the, the, the core of the issue is here. And, we, and again, it was a discussion we had yesterday around catchment areas, yeah, this idea of we're working within catchment areas. Um, 
And catchment areas are good because you get to know your patch and you kind of build up those relationships. But then that, that can, if, if you're not careful, that can effectively create another silo because you start saying, these are my people, this is my community, and kind of hands off other, other people. So I think it's another example of where we arbitrarily, artificially create things which, don't, which aren't kind of realities, yeah? I think once we start focusing on, on individuals and individual needs, then that, that's all that matters. The, 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 lo the location and the team that you work in and all those other uh, issues are kind of secondary to that. But critically, you need to, whatever you, whatever you learn from that experience, from that, from that relationship building, you need to have a mechanism where you can feed it into the, the whole organisation. Organisa I think I'm a great believer in organisational learning, in the whole organisation learning together and, and the, the, the learning organisation. And, and the, the trick we often miss is that, uh, and obviously we've got to, we've got to um, protect the, that relationship because it's a confidence, it's a confidential kind of thing. You know, it's about trust and respect. But there is a learning, there is some learning that comes out of it, and that learning needs to be added back into the organisation. And that's where I think we can start breaking down the silos. I was addressing particularly the silos that exist within organisations and the way that we construct our organisations often in, in columns and pillars that. that and hierarchies, and we need to have more cross kind of work in. And I see community development workers as great enablers of that. They're kind of the guerrilla workers. They're out there. They don't belong to kind of anyone or anything. They're doing their own thing within within parameters. But they're a great way of spreading uh, ideas and good practice and information and community uh, intelligence uh, across the community. And we really need to use everything that's out there in the community, the community skills and knowledge and experience, recognise it's as equal to, if not more important, than our own, and bring it together with our own and share it and pool it, which means sharing power, yeah, giving up resources to the community, uh, and uh, co-producing library services between us, which again is a kind of a huge shift. I kind of went a bit further on that one. Did, did, I, did I address the initial issue? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, first of all, we recognised that those categories kind of existed, um, and then we had we we work, we work with a team of consultants because we didn't have all of the in-house skills ourselves to um, to develop the plan, and we and we we gave them a profile of the community, and we said go out and basically recruit onto this panel to work with us, representatives, well, not representatives because all they represent is themselves, uh, but um, people who are from those particular segments. So we wanted a. Uh, a group of active users, people who, who knew us and who liked us, that was the easy bit, you know, we could just kind of go up to them in the library and, and, and have a conversation and pull them in. The lapsed users we did by, we, by using our uh, database, so we, we knew they were library members, but they hadn't used the library for some time, uh, so we could contact them by telephone, and, and they, they, those were quite easy to recruit as well. Um, the non-users were the most difficult, yeah, because we didn't, kind of, we didn't know who they were. So we had to use uh, the uh, we used an in-house, in sorry, an in-town team of consultants who who knew Thunder Bay, who knew the community, and who through their um, contacts uh, were able to identify p people who were non-users, non people who had no contact, previous contact with the service, and they were able to convince them it would be a good idea uh, to join this kind of focus group. It wasn't easy because. Uh, they said, "Well, we don't use the library. We don't know. We don't know. You know we don't know what we're talking about." Yeah, it was. They, they were the kind of hardest group to reach, and they were the quietest people on the panel initially. They didn't didn't seem to have much to contribute. But through the facilitation skills that the consultants had, they were able to kind of draw them out and to get them to posit opinions. And of course, what we found, and um, no, this isn't um, earth shattering, is that what the users, the lapsed users and the non-users wanted was fundamentally the same. There wasn't a lot of kind of difference between what they wanted from a library service. But the non-users were completely 
um, unfamiliar with the whole way that the library worked. And one of the most powerful things we did as part of the exercise was we did a walk through our, our biggest library with this group of non-users and we, we stayed completely silent and we just asked them to just comment, make comments. So the journey started outside the library as we walked up to it. They commented on how the library looked, on the access into the library. As we walked through the library, they talked about the counters, which we've still got, which are you know, a barrier. They talked about the signage, some of which was quite negative. Don't do this, don't do that. They asked why were the shelves so high. Now they, they kind of pointed things out. They, they pointed out the water that was all around us that we didn't kind of know uh, existed because we were so familiar with it. And that was probably the most powerful well, one of the most powerful contributions that the non-users brought to the process. And also, they were able to um, directly represent their own interests without, as I say, this whole kind of uh, staff having to second guess or assume what people wanted. Is that okay? There's been no questions over here yet. <laughs> I demand a question from this section. Well, that didn't work. At the back. Well, I don't want to kind of, yeah, I don't, I don't want to break any confidences, but I think the the, the main message I got was that um, you're not scared. That's one thing. Yeah. So the, some of these more challenging users uh, or, or people who come into the library who you interact with, um, there's no judgment going on here. Everyone can kind of come in and, and use the space. Uh, you have those conversations, uh, and it can sometimes take time to get to the point where they actually reveal um, you know, what their needs are and how they can be helped. You move beyond that kind of simple transactional relationship and this is what we provide in the story, or or here's the leaflet, or here's the signpost. And you say, I can work with you to connect you to other agencies that can get you a house, can get you a job. And in one of the stories I heard, maybe could even save your life. You know, it was kind of as, as serious as that. So it's this, this notion of the, the library worker um, using the full range of the resources around them, not just to provide a library service, but to provide um, in terms of that kind of Maslow's hierarchy, the other needs of, of people, which could be around housing, could be around schooling for their kids, could be around a bullying issue, could be around a completely non-library related activity, but it's your job as a library worker at Thunder Bay Public Library, as the message I will be given, to also address those, those other needs as well. Now, hopefully, uh, over time, that will enable that person to then engage with the library service and become you know, a, a typical library user. We're not doing it with that purpose in mind, but hey, that would be uh, a good outcome as well. So I think the, the, the stories I heard today are around that kind of, cri sometimes it's the kind of crisis intervention, it's kind of high level stuff, other, but other times it's a very low level kind of how you doing, how's your day, how's it going kind of approach. And we've still got the one strike and you're out attitude at Thunder Bay. People come in, it's all about, it's all about judgment of behavior and fitting a, uh, a very narrow model of what's acceptable, if you like, and you've kind of gone way beyond that here. And I've heard it said, you can't do that in kind of big busy libraries, you know, it's kind of impossible. You have to control it, you have to have all the rules and all the rest of it. Well, clearly you've demonstrated here that that, that other world is possible. Anyone around the corner there? No? Okay. Any more questions? Yes. I wouldn't say community led is a misnomer. I don't want you to think you're not doing the right thing, but I, but I, I do. I tend to personally put the the emphasis on on needs on on needs based, which I think is a slightly 
different concepts because community led you could be community, you could be led by the community that that's the active users yeah that could be the that could be the the leading force if you like within the community the ones who already know they're confident they're connected and all, and all the rest of it i'm much more interested in that kind of outer circle where those needs are but that community can't lead anything because they don't use the service and they haven't got the capacity and they haven't got the maybe the skills so that's where i always go first out into that outer sector so i think uh, needs identification is the core that's the way i would put it needs identification and prioritization and meeting those needs is the core of the community-led approach that's the way i would kind of rephrase it uh, but in order to get at those those needs you do need to develop the, the relationships and that's why the whole the title of the presentation was relationships the heart of the community-led model so to to kind of link those three together we have an aspiration to have a community-led model. We start with the, the three circles. We develop the relationships in all three, but we focus on the outer, and we use those relationships to identify the needs, and we focus on those communities with the greatest needs, which gives us the prioritization. So the, we're effectively being led by the community, but in a very kind of targeted and focused way. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't move away. I mean, my latest book's called Developing a Community-Led Library Service. I'm not going to abandon that, but I think with the, the focus within that does need to be on, on needs identification. Yes. and negotiating skills and crack open and the organization culture. You know, I know at the, our local library information study school here, we do some of that well and we do other aspects of that, I think not well enough. Can you speak to either your experience in the UK or what you're seeing in Canada that's been there for that long? But what can we as the library information study uh, education community in Canada be do to better support this incredibly important work so that not just the students that we have, but recruiting students into the programs to be green, recruiting faculty and staff and leaders into the schools, and then working with you know the school community, and we work really well with the PIE to have the five school. Thank you. But I think we can be doing more. I know many many people in this room that come to our program. Uh, I think we can be doing more to prepare them to support the incredible work that you have seen. Yes, I, th I think the obviously the library schools have got a big big role to play. Um, it's a kind of a chicken and egg thing, you know, and there's that kind of type X and type I behaviour that I was referring to earlier. I think traditionally library services, certainly in the UK, have attracted a certain kind of worker, a uh, kind of worker who thinks they who likes the rules, for example, who thinks their role is to control things. It's about social control rather than social change as being the the key role of the library agency. Uh, who are custodians of materials, that kind of whole mindset is, is deeply embedded. And, and even in the history of the public library movement, uh, you, you go back far enough to the, the mid-19th century in the UK, public libraries, in my view, were established for the deserving poor, not the undeserving poor. They were, they were, they were for people who behaved themselves and who had aspirations to move on. And that strand is still visible in, in public libraries to this day, which is why I think the community-led model is a transformational model. It's turning everything on its head. It's, you know, it's, it's a revolution. Now, two things we know about revolutions. One is they're very hard to start. And secondly, they're very hard to keep going. Um, and the way that you do both of those things is by having a, a cadre, you know, a, a group of, of staff who are, are committed to this way of working. So the, the, almost you, it starts at that whole point of kind of recruitment. Yeah? So when I'm recruiting at Thunder Bay Public Library, I'm looking for that kind of mindset, that set of skills that's around the empathy and the negotiation and the relationship building and the conflict management and all the rest of it. Um, and my expectation from a library school is that you would have put them through a program that, that puts them, that gets them to that place so that they're kind of ready packaged on arrival, trying to change them after that uh, is more challenging. So it would be nice to see library programs adopting community-led as, as a language and adopting a module or, or preferably 
the whole course, you know, being with, with that as the focus. Sure, we need people with the, the other more traditional skills to run our libraries, but that focus on, on the people elements, I think, has been kind of driven out. It's been driven out by technology, it's been driven out by a focus on finance and buildings and assets, and the whole role of the library in the community and as the agent of social change seems to have been driven out of, of library curriculums. So people people come to us without that, that head-on already. It's, it's, it's difficult. So the challenge to the library, the library school sector is there needs to be a, a revolution within the public library school movement. There needs to be a similar revolution within the way that um, public libraries uh, students are educated. Yeah, it's not a simple. It's not a simple kind of little fix here. It's, it's a it's a total solution that's required. Linda has risen. <laughs> this is a signal. Something big's going to happen. You can stay here. Thanks, okay. John. Okay. <laughs> so I, I just want to thank you all for attending, and I want to thank John as well. And some I, some points that I that I noted that um, um, of, of interest in your comments were challenges to us, and and I appreciate that you've recognized where we are in our community led approach. But I think you have challenged us to focus on non users and look at the equality and inequality in society and needs versus wants. Um, I really like that you, you indicated that it's everyone's job to be community-led in our organization, and I think it was particular poignant um, that you said, well, who do you work for? Um, so I, I agree with you. I think that we, we need to do a little bit of work on that to engage all staff in community-led. Um, you've challenged us to see the water around us, and, and I think it'll be really interesting for us to take a look at the water very carefully, see if we're drowning, see if we're ignoring it, and, and to examine it. So I appreciate it, John. Thank you very much. Okay. And okay. here's a small token of appreciation to you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>